Hey, Jerry Pal listeners, before we start the next podcast, we just want to thank all of our listeners for your continued support for the Jerry Pal podcast. In particular, we'd like to thank those two today who have contributed more than $100 to the Jerry Pal podcast, including Kim Christine, Matthew Schuster, Nina Flanagan, Penelope Thompson, Lloyd Wolstadt, Mark Wren, Carol Heyman, and Bob Rixey. And if you're interested yourself in contributing any amount, please go to our Jerry Powell website and click that little orange button that says donate and on to the show. Welcome to the Jerry Powell podcast. This is Eric Wadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? I'm oh, sorry. I was just falling asleep there. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. We have Brienne Miner, who is a geriatrician and sleep specialist and assistant professor at Yale in geriatrics. Welcome to the Jerry Powell podcast, Brienne. Thank you for having me. And we have Kathy Alessi, who is a geriatrician, director of the Geriatrics Research Education and Clinical Care Center at the VA Greater Los Angeles and professor of medicine at UCLA. Kathy, welcome to the Jerry Powell podcast. Thank you. Hello. We're going to be talking about sleep problems, insomnia, and older adults. But before we do, I believe, Brian, you have a song request for Alex? I do. My song request is Dreams by Fleetwood Mac. Terrific Can choice. I ask, why did you choose <laughs> Dreams? Well, I have always loved this song. But of course, we're going to talk about sleep today. So I thought this was topical. And I actually went back and looked at the lyrics to say, is it really about sleep? And I think it's about the way that, you know, those things that happen to you that disturb you during the day that you try to avoid or tuck under the rug, they kind of come back while you're sleeping. And it's sort of, you know, it also links to why sleep is so important to people. That's good. Because we all want to have that sort of sleep <laughs> that washes us clean and we wake up with a clean slate and some of us don't. And that's a very miserable place to be. Here, I thought it was just like a relationship tension and breakup song, but okay, that's better. I love it. Uh, here's a little bit, just a little bit. Now, here you go again. You say you want your freedom. Well, who am I? It's only right that you should play the way you feel it But listen carefully to the sound Of your loneliness like a heartbeat drives you mad In the stillness of remembering what you had And what you lost and what you have and what you lost Oh, thunder only happens when it's raining Players only love you when they're playing Say women, they will come and they will go When the rain washes you clean, you'll know, you will know, you will know. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Kathy, I'm going to start off with you. Sleep is a focus of your academic and clinical career. How did you get interested in this? Is sleep? Yeah. Actually, many years ago, I was I did some research on delirium, and then I was doing some research on nursing home residents, and we were doing work uh, looking at, I was interested in how sleep problems and nighttime events might uh, lead to delirium, and then I just became very, very interested in sleep, and so, so um, you know, pursued, uh, in addition to, you know, geriatric certification yeah. So it was like a path. It was a tortuitous route. <laughs> was it the same thing for you, Brian? So for me, um, I was working as a postdoctoral fellow in our geriatric clinic. 
um, our geriatric assessment clinic. And there were just so many people with sleep problems. And I didn't know how to help them. And so that's what really, I think at the same time, I was getting very interested in studying symptoms and in, in my research because symptoms matter a lot to people. Um, so it just kind of happened that the research and clinical uh, worlds met and it seemed to make a lot of sense for that reason to get clinical training in sleep, but also to start, start to study it. Yeah. And we'd say like, you, you noticed it was really common. Do we have like how, especially like an older adult topic is going to be sleep problems, insomnia and older adults. How common is this in the po- in the older adult population, more or less than the general population? More, I, I would say pretty easily 50%, maybe more of older people uh-huh. have, have, have some sort of sleep complaint. Kathy, what would you say? Yeah, it's very, very common and um, very common um, symptom or, you know, coexists commonly with other health conditions and in medications that are used impacted, you know, I mean, it's just extremely common. Yeah. What are the common um, comorbidities that's associated with? Like, what are the ones that come up to your mind right away when you hear that? You know, actually, basically, anytime I have a patient or their caregiver talk about a nighttime problem or problem with their sleep, I'm thinking about primary sleep disorders, you know, insomnia, sleep apnea, et cetera. Um, but I'm I'm also thinking about what, you know, other health conditions and other medications that might be causing them trouble. So I'm sort of trying to parse out, okay, is, so they're talking about their sleep, but is this a symptom of some other medical problem going on? Um, and often they're coexisting, you know? So often patients or their caregivers, to be honest with you, are, are, look, are asking for a simple solution. You know, sometimes that's medications. But I don't know how you are, Brianne, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so what else is going on that I should be thinking about? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's often the case that, um, you know, there has been a sort of, or I see a lot of patients where there's been a ba- Band-Aid, you know, and that's kind of like what a sleep medication is to me. And so when I see them, I'm really sort of getting this very detailed history and really finding out more about the sleep. And so instead of thinking about a Band-Aid, really trying to get at the underlying causes. Yeah. So what does that look like? So somebody comes into your office, Brianne, what kind of detailed history, what what are you looking for? What are some of the questions that you ask? So Usually the place that um, I start when I'm thinking specifically about their sleep and taking a history in that is, and I tell the trainees that I work with all the time to get very specific about what people mean when they say they have a sleep problem. Is it a problem falling asleep? Is it a problem maintaining sleep? Is it, you know, early morning awakenings? Is it daytime sleepiness? Um, And then also getting very specific sleep schedule. So what time are they going to bed? When are they getting out of bed for good? You know, how long are they in bed? What happens? Are they waking up? How long are they awake for during the day? Are they napping? And if so, how much are they napping? So I, I tell people to get very specific about the schedule. And mm-hmm. how often when you ask those questions, are you getting like reliable answers? Because often when I ask those questions, oh, I'm just not sleeping enough. Like how many hours are you sleeping when you fall yeah. asleep? It's often like vague, but it's this feeling that I'm not getting sleepy, I'm not getting enough sleep, or I'm sleeping, you know, I can't fall asleep um, quickly enough. Are you asking them to do like sleep logs, things like that? So, yeah, so the the sleep logs, let's put that aside for a second. Uh, But I I, I do think people can give you pretty specific information and... um, I guess you got to ask it very specifically. Yeah, I think, right. You sort of take it piece by piece. All right. So what time do you usually go to bed? Yeah. You know what, Brianne, even what I do is I'll say, if they're like you're describing, Eric, I'll say, okay, what about last night? Mm -hmm. What time did you go to bed last night or the night before? Um, You know, what, how long did it take you to fall asleep? What time did you get up out of bed? How many times did you get up during the night? I think, um, you know, like a lot of conditions in older people, if if their answers are vague, then asking very a very specific timeline, like last night or a night before, that might may be able to 
to help with that. And and also, I think, Brian, you know, I don't know if you agree, but when I'm asking those questions, I'm also trying to figure out, are there problematic behaviors, sleep related behaviors that they've gotten themselves into that are actually contributing to the insomnia? You know, are they going to bed really, really early and lying awake in bed and not getting up out of bed because they think they need to stay in bed longer so they can sleep better? And that's actually contributing to their poor sleep. Yeah. yeah and that's why getting the schedule is so important, right? It's like, well, when did you wake up? But when did you get out of bed for good? Right. If there's a big difference there, they're spending too much time in bed. If you if you ask the, the schedule in that very specific way, you can start to find out things like that. You might also get a, you know, you made me think, Eric, like sometimes people say, I just don't sleep. Yeah. I just don't sleep. Or yeah. their sleep is so irregular that they can't tell you a schedule. And 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 I think that is a problem, right? That is a person who then needs a schedule, right? If they're sort of if they're really sort of saying, My my sleep is all over the place and I can't tell you what time I usually go to bed. Well, then they need to fix that. Are you also talking to their significant others, like getting other information about how things are going at night? Hundred percent. And I think that it's interesting. This is a, a place where sleep and geriatrics overlap really nicely. I think it comes very naturally to a sleep physician to get collateral history no. from the bed partner um, because there are just certain things that you're not going to know unless you talk to a bed partner, right? So are they snoring? Are they acting out dreams? Like what are they doing when they're sleeping? You can observe but they don't know about. Um, and it's just, I'm sure, Kathy, you'll agree that you'll have these people come in who say, I'm here because my wife made me come, right? Like, I don't think I have a problem, but my wife made me come. <laughs> that actually happens a lot in the sleep clinic. So I think in both geriatrics and sleep, we're very often trying to get collateral. And so, you know, for my clinic, where I see a lot of patients with cognitive impairment, I, I also have to do that to sort of say, you know, he tells me his sleep is just fine. And then, you know, the partner says, no, that it's not. You know, he says he doesn't have any sleep problems and he's up all night long and he sleeps all day or, you know, something. Like that. Yeah. I'm going to go back to, I noticed you had a reaction when I used the phrase sleep lock. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> what was that about? Uh, we should use them. Okay. Oh, yeah. It wasn't a, don't ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's just that the reliability of getting the information back is... Okay. Uh, that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, we shouldn't give up on it and just say, oh, we, we just can't get this information. But, but it's, you know, I, I, I would say I have like a 50% return rate on the sleep logs that I send okay. out. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, if you, you know, if you, granted, it's, it's difficult to hit someone with, I want you to fill out a two week sleep log. <laughs> you know, the first time they tell you that they're having trouble with their sleep. But when you get if you get to the point where you're you want to actually treat them behaviorally, if they have insomnia, you're going to have to get a sleep log, really, because you because the whoever is helping them work through their CBTI, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or, you know, a similar type of treatment, they're going to, I, don't you think, Brianne, they're going to need a sleep log in order to work them through that, that treatment. So, but maybe, yeah, you maybe, know, part of it, you might set a, a schedule for them and, you know, yeah. the, the, you're not even going to know if they're sticking to the schedule. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or if things are like, improving, right? I guess you could yeah. tell based on if yeah. they're feeling any different. Do you ever use like you know, the new techie stuff, like if somebody yeah, has an Apple Watch, watch. or a... yeah. So I use that stuff a lot in my research. Um, in the clinical setting, uh, not so much. How about you, Kathy? Do you? No, no. My my clinic is very old, uh, and so I don't have a lot of Apple Watch users in my clinic. But um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, in a younger population, or you know, someone. Uh, the The problem is the the validity of the device. Yeah. You know, knowing for sure how well the device is reflecting reality is not quite as clear, as far as I know, uh, as as the research grade actigraphy that we use in in our research projects. Yeah, yeah. So I think that you know the best thing these devices do is give you a sense of the 
total sleep time at night. Um, and so that's probably something that you could track from night to night as, as people are going through therapy. But I think most of the time when we see these devices, they're causing more problems yeah. because we see people who are just, they're obsessing about their sleep and they're saying, well, the watch gave me this score for my sleep last night, you know? And so oftentimes we are telling people with insomnia, we're saying, all right, stop, no more watch. Okay. <laughs> I, I actually the- noticed my Apple watch gave me anxiety. <laughs> Yeah. To stop using it. Yeah, that's a good point. And we're trying to get people to, you know, have less anxiety about their sleep. So when when we're treating them for insomnia. So so it can be counterproductive. And when we think about sleep problems, insomnia, older adults, they're in your clinic. Are there like especially around like insomnia, are are there meds that they may be on that are like like a lot of meds can cause sleep problems, right? Are there mm-hmm. ones that are like your, your high yield, man, that's a bad, bad drug for you. Mm. I have some thoughts about this. Yes. So, so number one is when they say I'm taking Tylenol and then I can sleep, that's Tylenol PM until proven otherwise, which, you know, for those people listening who don't know means it has Benadryl in it, right? Or diphenhydramine, which we really don't like for treating sleep problems and also for people who might have cognitive concerns. Um, so that's, that's one pearl. And then the other thing that, that I tell my trainees that I always look for when people have trouble initiating sleep or trouble sleep, staying asleep is I look, are they on an SSRI? Uh, because we know that those can exacerbate underlying sleep disorders. So those are two that come to my mind. How about you, Kathleen? All SSRIs, SNRIs, are they part of that too? Or just any antidepressant? All of them. Uh, yeah, so so any any SSRI or any SNRI and, and tricyclics can do it as well. Okay. Hmm. Kathy, anything else come to your mind? Um, sometimes it's obvious things like the patient who's on a diuretic and they're taking it late in the day because they have things they want to do during the daytime and they don't want to have to be going to the bathroom during the daytime. So they're taking it in the afternoon or evening. You know, so sometimes it's it's things pretty obvious. Um, there are some medicines that are reliably sedating, some that are reliably stimulating, uh, but there is a little bit of idiosyncrasy there among people. So sometimes... I find it helpful to ask the patient or their caregiver, well, you know, what do you think is is causing this person trouble mm. with their sleep? Yeah. And just sort of related to that, I would say I get a lot of bang for my buck by just finding out, are they on something that's just sedating them during the day Yeah, so that they're not able to sleep at night? I mean, that happens a lot, especially people who might be on behavioral medications. You know, I think the classic example is somebody who just came out of the hospital they're, they are put on these new medications because they were, you know, having yes. problems in the hospital and now they're home and they don't need those anymore. Yeah. And, you know, then you get the call from the family that can't sleep at night. And if you ask, you get that history from the, the care partner, you may find out, oh, actually, yeah, he's sleeping a lot in the middle of the day. Well, then let's decrease the sedating meds during the day. And anything else from the history or the physical that's going to help you around the the differential of the the sleep problem? Well, uh, yeah. So, you know, there are um, certain sleep disorders, certain sleep problems, which are either very common or very important in older people. And I know our focus right now today is on on insomnia, but I don't think you can consider insomnia in an older person without considering all the other sleep problems that that can that are more common in older people because primary insomnia, you know, quote unquote, simply insomnia and not a comorbidity or not another sleep disorder, I think is pretty rare in older people, that at least the older people that I see in geriatric clinics. So I'm always going through my differential in my head, okay, do they have any symptoms of restless legs? Are they snoring? Do they have excessive daytime sleepiness? Do I have to worry that this person is one of the many, many, many people that have unrecognized sleep apnea? You know, are they having a movement disorder? Are they, uh, Brianna, I think talked earlier about um, acting out their dreams. Do they have, are they um, having vivid dreaming and shouting out or moving around at night? So I have to worry about REM sleep behavior disorder, you know? So, so I, I, I think 
um, you know, I assume Brianna is the same. And when it's an older person, I'm always running through my head of, you know, the simple items which will help me know if I need to veer towards one of these other sleep problems or, you know, one of the geriatric syndromes. Uh, is this actually a symptom of depression? Are they depressed? And so I jump into my, you know, quick couple of items screeners for depression. Do they have anxiety? I, th- I think I the key think that's here a great is that, point. We were yeah. talking about comorbidities yeah. before, and we didn't mention those psychiatric comorbidities and sleep and psychiatric comorbidity goes, they go hand in hand. So mm. I use, I actually, I use a depression screen and I also use an anxiety screen. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I find those to be very useful. Mm. And, and I think treating those I have seen can really help sleep problems a lot. Hmm. So I'm treatment. guessing also substance use, alcohol use disorder, yeah. probably high up there too on your yeah. list of things to think about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, people know that alcohol can help them fall asleep, but they don't realize that it may wake them up in the middle of the night or that they might not metabolize alcohol to the same extent in their older age that they did in their middle age. So and that's that's just, that's just a start. That's just dipping our toe in the substance use and how that might affect sleep. Yeah, thing that depression can both cause sleep dis- disorders, and the treatment for depression can cause um, sleep disorders. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're yeah. used to complex, <laughs> complex yeah. medical situations, right? Yeah, that's why we're in geriatrics. We like to, you know, we're, we're we like to sort that through, but but also. People who have sleep problems that are not being addressed are uh, more likely to become depressed too. So, oh, yeah, both ways, right? Yeah, and then a whole, you know, a huge reason that I think Kathy and I are both here is that this link between sleep and dementia, right? So, I think what do we what know we, about sleep and dementia? Well, that's a that's probably like a topic for a whole nother podcast. But I, I think what's what's really interesting that we're we're learning more about all the time is glymphatic function, right? So the glymphatics are sort of the lymphatics of the brain, right? That that are um, clearing neurotoxins, things like beta amyloid. Um, and we think that these are this this glymphatic function is is taking place while we sleep. Um, so we're learning more about, you know, how we measure it, um, what it actually is, what it's doing in the brain, um, which I think is allowing us to understand more about why is it that sleep problems seem to increase risk of dementia. We should, I know in the interest of time, we should just get to the cut to the chase here. So is that when you prescribe the benzodiazepine? (laughs) (laughs) No. No. With a melatonin shooter. Yeah, it's I mean, you know, it's funny. I'm a I'm a sleep doctor, and I will tell you, I prescribe very few hypnotics because what I generally find is there's a lot that needs to be done in these patients in terms of finding a history and you know taking a history, doing some evaluation that may or may not include getting a sleep study de-prescribing certain medications from the medication list, thinking about behavioral interventions. There's a lot to do before you have to go to a hypnotic. Yeah. You know, and I find too that the that it's very helpful to, for me to at least keep in my mind that the majority of patients, older patients that you see that have a sleep problem, that have insomnia, have had it, they've had it for years. So I don't have to fix it that day. And I certainly don't have to fix it by giving them a medication that's going to increase their risk of falls and fractures and stuff like that. So, you know, I, th- I think it's helpful to remember that for the vast majority of these patients, they've had their insomnia for some time. And so they have time to sort of think it through and, and, and work it out. And I, I agree with Brianne. I think we're, we're, we're like, you know, we're laughing when you say, uh, when do you prescribe the benzodiazepine? But I think, at least for me, never, <laughs> you know, I mean, I really, uh, at least for insomnia, it would be, I can't remember prescribing a benzo or non-benzo for uh, an older person with insomnia, if they're on it, they came to me on it. Mm-hmm, yeah. And then I'm trying to get them behavioral treatment to to help them, you know, work through CBTI and medication tapering and 
I'll say things like, well, you know, when did you start this medicine? And they say, when I was 60. And, and like, well, you know, you're 80 now. And so the effects of this medicine are different uh, and more problematic in you now. And I so think when I was in med school, quite receptive to you sort of explaining why it is that you don't want to use those medications. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about non-farm treatment because um, when I was in med school, they taught us about sleep hygiene and the importance of sleep hygiene. And uh, in preparation for this, I'm seeing that sleep hygiene by itself really doesn't do anything. Education around sleep hygiene is that is that right? Has uh, have we moved on beyond just recommending sleep hygiene? I think that you know what you're bringing up is that if you look at somebody who's you know, a behavioral sleep specialist and, yeah. and somebody who specializes in treating insomnia and they hear that the way you treat insomnia is through sleep hygiene, then they groan, right? Because <laughs> it's not enough, right? You can't just say, here's a, here's a sheet, you know, here's 30 things that you need to do and that'll, that'll treat your insomnia. So yeah. I think that's the problem for, for people without an insomnia disorder, sleep hygiene can be very helpful. But if you're really thinking about somebody who's got insomnia disorder, then it's not enough. Is that like chronic insomnia versus... And do you separate that from like acute insomnia? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you're, we're saying this to somebody who's had, you know, insomnia for... You know, there's, there's criteria out there. But it, essentially, it's sleep problems at night that are causing impairments in daytime function. Uh-huh. And there is a chronicity to it. Yeah. So it's not an, an, an acute thing. And usually, like Kathy said, when we see these people, they've had it for years. Yeah. So the sleep hygiene, it, it does, you know, as Brianna is, you know, I'm hoping that you're, you're picking the nuance of what she's saying, I think, is that sleep hygiene can be very helpful in people who have sort of your run of the mill, yeah. mild symptoms. Um, you know, it can be very helpful to have them learn some tips. Don't lie awake in bed yeah. while you, you know, get up out of bed, um, do something soothing and quiet and then go back to bed later. Um, get up at the same time every morning. You know, set a sleep structure uh, structure to your bedtime and wake time, especially your wake time. So, you know, all these kind of tips can be very helpful. And they are part of the behavioral treatment, like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. They're a part of it, but they're not they're not adequately effective alone. So they're incorporating these things like CBTI. Yeah, I, I personally think there is no excuse for us not to be providing and getting CPTI for our patients. And I think that's particularly true in an older adult where the risks of medications are so much higher. Uh, and it, I mean, the evidence is clear. You know, this is these. This is a very potent treatment. There are multiple ways that you can get it for your patients. Yeah, so, on your phone now too, right? You can use yep. apps for that and on the yep. internet. and. Yep. And this is also a place where we have really good studies in older people uh, yeah. to show that CBTI or BBTI, we often call it the brief behavioral therapy intervention, that they're very effective for treatment of insomnia. Who do you um, refer patients to or do you, what, what resources do you give them in order to connect them with CBTI or brief therapy? Uh, well, where I work, um, CBTI is readily available. Actually, this you know much of the research that we're doing in in the research group that I'm involved in involves some form of CBTI or CBTI with another condition, CBTI in patients who also have sleep apnea, you know, whatever. So, so um, but in in the clinic um, through mental health, I'm able to get CBTI pretty regu- readily for my patients. That may not be the same everywhere, but I don't know, Brianna, what your experience is. Same for us in our sleep clinic. We have um, a couple different behavioral sleep medicine providers that can do CBTI. Oh, so that's, that's probably a good resource for anybody out there who's thinking, how do I get this for my patient? You know, think about mm-hmm. sending them to a sleep clinic. And is yeah. there like another key component of CBTI? You mentioned that good sleep hygiene might be a part of it and a structured approach to sleep, but what else do they do in CBTI? Like- yeah, so um, and intervene, <laughs> Brian, you know, yeah. So it's it's generally a combination, of, you know, getting into the, the details of it. It's a, a combination of some very specific treatments. And so this is not you know, this is not psycho, and I'm, you know, I'm not a mental health professional, but this is not psychoanalysis. This is, you know, very specific structured process in order to help people change behavior, which they generally have developed over time, which is perpetuating 
their sleep problem. And so it's typically uh, sleep restriction. So you limit the amount of time. I'm going to like do it as a non-mental health professional, right? But sleep restriction, we're limiting the amount of time that they're in bed to more closely resemble the amount of time that they actually sleep. So having them not spend lots of time awake in bed so that they can more properly train their time in bed to either intimacy or sleep. Um, stimulus control is uh, a part of that sort of training them to, uh, to, to not do things in bed, which are will train their brain to think that, that the bedtime is for something other than sleep. Cognitive therapy, where you're, you're fixing these false beliefs that people develop, like, I, I didn't sleep well last night, so I need to spend more time in bed tonight uh, so I can have enough opportunity to sleep. But actually, that's perpetuating the problem. And there are other things, uh, too. But it's, it's really, mm-hmm. I, I think, the key to understand it is it's really quite structured. Do you ever do things like bright light therapy? Is that a thing anymore? Sure. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think then you're sort of thinking more about people's circadian rhythm. And whether you're trying to shift that, in some okay. ways. you know, if somebody's, if somebody has a delayed sleep phase, so they want to go to bed at, you know, two o'clock in the morning, instead of what's a more sort of societally normal time, um, then you could, you know, you could use bright light in that situation or somebody who is an early phase, they go to bed too early, you could use bright light. Um, and you could also use melatonin in those situations. So those are sort of, oh, you uh, we heard a drop M. finally. Yeah, part. Okay. <laughs> What about melatonin? We have, I think, every patient I see in the hospitals on melatonin. Is mel- yeah, is, is that the right approach or is that an issue? It's somewhere between it's, like 0.5 and 10 milligrams. Never know. It's, it's always a surprise there. what right. they're on. It's like uh, <laughs> my feelings about melatonin. Um, it's generally not harmful, especially if you make sure people don't just keep going up and up and up on the dose. If we're talking about REM sleep behavior disorder, that's a place where it's actually very helpful. So, REM, you know, can you just oh, one sentence? What is REM sleep behavior disorder? This, this is acting out your dreams because you're you still have muscle tone during your uh-huh. dreams, your REM sleep. So, um, that's a place where we actually do use it in higher doses. Um, so, like you know, six to twelve milligrams. Otherwise, okay. you know, for insomnia disorder, it doesn't help. But I, so I think we're using it a lot because we feel like we can give the person something to help them sleep that's not harmful, uh, but it's probably not helpful. Yeah. And and do you agree, Kathy? It's not harmful. I see patients who are delirious. Well, I'm sure you do too, and all the time, right, in the hospital. And I wonder is that melatonin contributing that six milligrams or eight milligrams of melatonin or whatever they're on? Or do you yeah. think that's ah, something else, probably? Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not usually real concerned about discontinuing their melatonin, you know, right or wrong. I, um, uh, so um, kind of like the same approach Brian has is that they, it's, it's relative, for most people, it's, it's relatively harmless and it's probably not causing them a problem. Uh, but the other thing also, I think, particularly in clinic is, Brian mentioned the RBD, the REM sleep behavior disorder, which is increasingly being recognized and people are more and more aware of it. So I also want to be sure that I'm not stopping melatonin that is treating something that I, I haven't gotten the information about yet. You know, I do see more and more use of melatonin in the hospital setting. And um, I don't, you know, I'm not sure the evidence is really strong for that, but um, it is probably pretty benign. In terms and if you of- were going to use it, how much and when do you actually give it? If hypothetically you're going to believe it does something, do you have to give it right around the time they fall asleep? Do you have to give it an hour before? You have to give it. So if you're giving it because you want to help them fall asleep, it does yeah. have some weak hypnotic effect. So some weak ability to help people fall asleep. Uh-huh. And so then you probably want to give it about an hour before okay. sleep. And like one or um, milligram, one to three milligrams, sound about right? Yeah. I mean, our release of melatonin from our pineal gland is on the order of micrograms. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> in theory, one milligram is a, is a super therapeutic dose and it's plenty. I think the problems we run into is, you know, this is not FDA. It's not yeah. controlled, right? So you don't actually know that you're getting a milligram. But so. there is, right? We got remelteon. Is it remelteon? Did I pronounce that one right? 
I struggle with all of these pronunciations. So you got a melatonin receptor agonist, right? Should we I use never that? No. <laughs> Do you think there's a role there? No. Kathy? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have it on our formulary and maybe there are some patients where it's helpful um, and it's probably, you know, and it does, it's pretty benign, you know, yeah. so it's probably not causing a lot of trouble. It's, as far as I know, it's not been compared yeah. to head with melatonin. So yeah. I'm not really sure if it has a benefit over using melatonin, if you know that that tablet actually has melatonin in it. Well, the other one we see a lot in the hospitals, trazodone. Everybody's on trazodone 25, maybe trazodone 50 if they're having a lot of problems. Thoughts on trazodone? You want to do that one? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, trazodone is every medication has risks, right? Yeah. Uh. Um, but some red- medications are riskier than others. So like, I think we use a lot of trazodones to uh, avoid using riskier medications. Um, and I think, you know, the evidence of it is out there that it's not helpful for people with insomnia disorder. Um, but for people with more mild symptoms, I think, you know, I will use it in that case. Okay. Now, the one that I, I'm, I don't know a lot about, but I see it. And I think there's some studies in patients with like mild to moderate dementia is that was the dual orixin receptor antagonists? Yeah. What what the heck are those? And do you ever use them? So I will say quickly that I don't use them. Um, mostly until it's because until recently they've been so expensive. And um, you know I know the study you're talking about. Where they have they have used this medication in people with Alzheimer's disease. So, and it was a randomized controlled trial and they, you know, used the gold standard to measure sleep, but people had, you know, pretty mild disease, not a lot of other comorbidities and they didn't use the medication for very long. So I don't think we have like, you know, really strong evidence. Um, And I think, you know, it just tends to be the case that in our patients with a lot of medical problems and a lot of other medications that using this one adding this onto everything in my mind, isn't necessarily going to be that much less harmful than using any of the other medications that you might. So I I sort of think of it, or I was saying before, like I have a lot of people who come to my clinic with, with bad insomnia and it's just another medication in the mix that they've tried that hasn't worked. Uh, But I will, you know, I will say I don't use it a lot. So Kathy, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts here. So a short answer is that, uh, I have not been using it in my uh, dementia patients yet. No. Oh, yeah. And real quick, because I don't know too much about these drugs. So they're like, was it Suvorexin? Suvorexin, Lembo-Rexin. There might be some. Are, are there a lot of side effects like you see with like the benzoreceptor? Yeah. So it's it's working on a different, through a different mechanism, right? Uh-huh. So it's not acting on the benzo, the, the GABA receptor. Yeah. Um, it's it's blocking the effect of orexin, which is a wake promoting neurotransmitter. Uh, hmm. so it is working through a different mechanism, um, but I I do think that there's you know even if you look in that study in people with Alzheimer's disease where they only took it for like four weeks or something, there was still you know daytime sedation there and there were still falls. So yeah. uh, so I think what Kathy is trying to say is we need more data. And then last thing, I know it's the top of the hour and we got to let you go. Maybe like one thing you, you both are, I know both of you are working around this space. One thing that you're doing that you're excited about right now, kind of moving forward as far as next steps. Brianna, how about for you? Okay. So my work is all really related to how we measure sleep in older people. So I and doing stuff to, to say we need to we need to assess sleep more globally, thinking about people's quality, people's duration, and also the timing of sleep. So bringing in that circadian component, and then really starting to use these measures in people with with cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. So that's that's what I'm working on right now. That's great, Kathy. So we're working on a study to help middle-aged and older adults who have sleep apnea have, quote, failed PAP therapy who are not using their PAP, and we use behavioral treatment to um, improve their use of PAP. That's that's what I like to do. Great. Well, be mindful of the time. Maybe we can get a little bit more back to our dreams. Alex? Now here I 
I go again, I see your crystal visions. I keep my visions to myself. It's only me who wants to wrap around your dreams and have you any dreams you'd like to sell? Dreams of loneliness like a heartbeat drives you mad in the stillness of remembering what you had and what you lost. And what you had And what you lost Oh, thunder only happens when it's raining Players only love you when they're playing Well, women, they will come and When the rain washes you clean, you'll know, you will know, you will know. Kathy, Brian, thank you for joining us on this podcast. It was fabulous. And for all of our listeners, you can get, go to our show notes. We'll have more information on there. And with that, I want to thank everybody for joining on this podcast. Thank you, uh, Brianna and Kathy. Thank you so much for having us and talking about this topic. That's my favorite topic. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, everybody. And we'd like to say a special thank you to those Jerry Powell listeners who've donated more than $250. Including Susan Nelson, Christopher Heck, Lindsay Yorman, Mo Rizawi, Sue Borson, Carrie Rubenstein, Marissa... Galicia Castillo, Cara Bischoff, Kate Mesrich, James Tulski, Louise Aronson, Asher Edwards, Mark Apfel, Michael Bordofsky, Dwayne Dobschutz, Frisch Brandt, Kelly Strait, Daryl Owens, Roseanne Leipzig, Elizabeth Chung, Amis Samoji, Harry Hahn, Nick Schneeman, Ed Martin, Jeff and Lena Galbraith, Himanshu Mahotra, Nina Flanagan, Penelope Thompson, Lloyd Woolstadt, Mark Wren, Carol Heyman, and Bob Rixey. Thanks, everyone.